Talking all things Ole Miss Rebels football. Lane Kiffin and company looking to bounce back after suffering their first loss of the 2024 season against Kentucky. They now head to Columbia, South Carolina to take on the Gamecocks. Juice Wells heading to his former stop. Tons of storylines surrounding this one and helping us talk all things Rebels. One of the best in the business, Ben Garrett of Ole Miss Spirit, the On3 affiliate for the Rebels. Ben, what's going on, man? Appreciate you taking the time. Man, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's It's been a wild week. It's been a mess of a week after Kentucky, obviously, and a lot of disappointment, a lot of trying to figure out what the heck went wrong. But uh, I think we've kind of figured that out at this point. Offensively, they're just not where we thought they were or where they should be. Uh, defensively, they're every bit as good as we thought they would be. Um, the fact that we're talking about offensive issues in year five of the Lane Kiffin team is is pretty alarming. But uh, maybe Kentucky was the outlier, the wake-up call that they needed. I have my very serious doubts of that. Um, but this team is loaded for Barry. It does have one of the best and most talented all-22s, and that's not just coming from this idiot talking to you. It's coming from uh, any analytics that, are, that you pay attention to or give value to. Ole Miss has one of the best all-22s. So now you kind of understand – my Ole Miss fans are um, quite disappointed this week or quite upset this week, and for every reason, because with Lane Kiffin, it was never about winning or, or losing games that they weren't supposed to lose. It was always about not winning those games against the Alabamas, the Georgias. You're talking about being one of those teams, but you're not really being about being one of those teams. And this is the first time that an Ole Miss team under Lane Kiffin has lost to a team that it shouldn't have lost to. And Kentucky's a good enough football team. It's going to be a postseason team. Uh, defensively, he's got some NFL players on it. Pretty stout, a top 25 defense, you could argue for sure. Uh, but offensively, it, you knew what they wanted to do to you, grind me it up, make it messy, and that's exactly what you allowed them to do. And offensively, you couldn't make the adjustments to change that up and to make things go the other way. So it's, it's a mess of a week. It's some figuring some things out this week. And unfortunately for Ole Miss, they got their nine cons done with. Their bye week doesn't come for another two weeks. You got a South Carolina team that boat raced that Kentucky team that you got to travel to now. So uh, it, it's it's certainly a gut check week for Ole Miss football this week. Ben, I think that's a great way to put it. And you mentioned again, you know, Ole, Ole Miss, and I talked about it over the summer, Ben. And I didn't mean it as an insult, but when you look at the schedule, I was like, Ole Miss is the one team in college football that plays a preseason. Like when you looked at their first four games. It was going to give the Rebels an opportunity to work out any kinks and build up confidence and, you know, have these pieces mesh together that you picked up in the transport. And Ole Miss handled their business in those first four. Then comes the start of SEC play, and the Kentucky game mm -hmm. inexplicably happened. From what you saw against the Wildcats, Ben, are these things that can be easily corrected, or is there greater concern there when it comes to what you saw in that 20-17 to 17 loss? Well, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? I mean, I think that, unfortunately for Ole Miss, um, they proved their haters right. Congrats to the haters, right? Because uh, the bottom line is all the areas that you knew you had an issue with for the first four weeks again, and it was across the board. It was an offensive line that couldn't protect Jackson Dart. It was um, – a, front, a field corner situation where Ole Miss has struggled all year, trying to find some protection, some coverage. Obviously, Trey Amos, they had it in spots, but when the play they had to have was made, was needed to be made against Barry and Brown, that field corner showed up again, that issue at field corner. So it's a great question, um, and I don't have the answer to that. I know that the offensive line, if – if Kentucky was more of what they are than what the first four games was, and considering that that was the first team they played all year, stands to reason that it's going to be more like that than it was the first four weeks then. Then, yeah, the offensive line is a real concern. It's not just um, underperformance either. You're talking about injury concerns with Jeremy James, who's out for a month. He's been a multi-year starter, five-year starter for Ole Miss. Uh, Caleb Warren, who was a three-year starter at center, who they moved to guard. He hadn't gotten on the field yet. He was – maybe going to play against Kentucky and didn't show up. Jerquan Scott was signed or added out of the transfer portal in the number three transfer class for Ole Miss. He was going to be their starting center, according to like Joe Judge made that suggestion, put uh, Jerquan Scott there, and he did. He was performing well in the spring and then on in the fall camp. He got hurt. And now Jaden Williams, who was arguably their most valuable offensive lineman, uh, has a torn meniscus. 
and he didn't start. He was a surprise scratch on Saturday. Now, uh, fortunately, we get some injury reports, so these coaches can't be too uh, you know secretive about this stuff anymore. Jane Williams pops up on the injury report, come to find out it's meniscus. And if there's an ACL tear uh, that they discover in there, then that's even worse. That's an even longer recovery, maybe missing the year. Uh, they don't know where that is now. But the point is, is offensive line, if you're talking about, well, this week's a mess, it is no better personified than with that offensive line that Ole Miss thought it had corrected. Because what was the biggest knock uh, like your own? The, the big thing was, yeah, they, they talk a big game. And they look good against, you know, the teams they're supposed to look good against. Can you go be that against Georgia and Alabama? Well, they need to do that by refortifying or solidifying the defensive and offensive lines. You thought that's what they had done. Defensively, they've been as good. 20 points allowed uh, for a Lane Kiffin team should always result in a win, I would say. Now, you could argue that. I would say that 17 points, that lays at the feet of Lane Kiffin and Charlie Weiss and offensive staff, and that is alarming. So is it fixable? Well, Lane Kiffin has the third uh, most wins of any head coach or for any school since 2020. He has the benefit of the doubt. However, the question he never lost to a team he wasn't supposed to lose to before. He's now one in four in SEC openers. You're starting to ask different questions than you were heading into Kentucky. And if you'd have just won the game, survived in advance. No one cares about style points anymore. There's no style with this college football playoff. You know that probably better than anybody. I mean, um, you got teams still in – I mean, Ole Miss is in contention today, number 12 in the AP poll, despite that loss because it's such a big field. They need to be thanking their lucky stars. Um, so I give Lane the benefit of the doubt, but if you're asking about long-term issues, that offensive line isn't something that can just be solved in a week. Um, they just got to get out there and do it. And I think Diego Pounds, the transfer from North Carolina, having a good game against Kentucky in a crappy, crappy game for everybody else was encouraging, but he still was a turnstile, too much of a turnstile, too much ice skating. So it was Micah Pettison pass pro and the two Washington transfers in the interior and a six-year backup at center who's been playing for Caleb Warren and Jerquan Scott. He got exposed against NFL players like you worried that he would. So can you find a way – to reverse that? It's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, we're going to find out starting Saturday because no longer is it a fun, cute, oh, they've arrived, Ole Miss is the fun story. Now it's like, oh, uh, a title contender that has already face planted and we just got to October. It ain't even spooky season yet. <laughs> and yet Ole Miss is living a nightmare. I know it's corny, but it's true. I mean, this is the worst possible uh, result because you proved all of your haters right. You gave them all the ammunition they need. You haven't played anybody. Mm -hmm. um, you can't score against – I mean, you can't make adjustments off script because they look really good on that first drive where they were scripted. Mm -hmm. So ben, we'll see yeah. how it works out. We'll see how it works out. But um, Ole Miss has proven that making adjustments, getting off script, is just not something that it's been good at. And mm -hmm questions when you weren't asking those questions before Kentucky. So Ben, Ole Miss travels to South Carolina to take on the Gamecocks. I got to get your perspective on this because a lot of the chatter from the South Carolina side obviously centers around Juice Wells and, and his oh, return yeah. to williams Bryce State. And I'm sure, I'm sure you guys saw, you know, whenever he entered the portal and committed to the Rebels, uh, the reaction on social media, I to say it was vitriol filled is putting it nicely. What, what's <laughs> I, I, give me the Ole Miss perspective on that Juice Wells storyline. Like, I'm not sure it really plays into what the, the final result of the game will be necessarily, but you're already seeing the trash talk this week going into the game. Just your overall thoughts on Juice Wells going back to williams Bryce Stadium. Maybe, maybe South Carolina fans' feelings around him. Well, I, I get it. I mean, this transfer culture is hard for everybody. It really is. I mean, it's not just – it's not like Ole Miss is benefiting from it only. You know, it's had some real pain, too. It's had some guys leave and have success elsewhere. Now, they've far more dramatically had success through the portal than uh, the portal taking away. A Juice Wells, for them, was just an opportunity. You know, it, it's unfortunate they kind of lined up this way with what they're coming off of. Uh, but Ole Miss needed real impact opposite Trey Harris, you know. So, from the Ole Miss angle, 
it's there's nothing personal, right? There's nothing like, oh, let's go get win one for juice, win one for the Gipper. That's not how that really works anymore because yeah, you see that in the NFL too, and that's very much what college football is now. I know like some traditional fans, maybe you're like me and wish it were like that. We're like the old ways in a lot of ways. It's not. So knowing that um, from Ole Miss's side, it was just business, man. They just needed a, a wide receiver opposite uh, Trey Harris because, one, Deion Smith, there was doubt about his eligibility. Uh, two, Aiden Williams, a former four-star in-state recruit that they love, has still not made the impact that they thought he would. Uh, and behind those two, Jordan Watkins was banged up. Yeah, you got some transfers in, but Juice was the best of the bunch. Now, as far as Juice is concerned, oh, yeah, he's motivated. Of course he is. He wants to go in there and – uh, show South Carolina. I don't even know what he'd be showing them, though. That's the only thing. The only thing I don't understand with the juice storyline is this. The man got hurt last year. He was not himself. He was an injury risk uh, for both, like for Ole Miss to take the risk on him. They didn't know if he was going to be healthy, quite frankly. And all in the offseason, that was that was a, that was a real question mark of how healthy would he be? He was banged up in the spring. He was banged up in the fall, too. Um, and yet he's been able to stay on the field. So that's a great individual story uh, and accomplishment just for him because he was not a good wide receiver last year. It was a completely lost year for him at South Carolina. And that, for South Carolina fans, I'm sure is the most frustrating thing is because in 2022, he was one of the very best, if not the best, wide receiver in the SEC. And traditionally, that's your guy, right? That's our guy. Why is he doing that for them? But uh, – I'm not so naive as to think that there wasn't also some decision making on the side of South Carolina that when they went to that and said, Hey, I've got NIL opportunities. I could go here, here, and here. And they say, well, we don't value you that at that number anymore. It's exactly what happened with Ole Miss and Quinshawn Judkins, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly what happened. Now Ole Miss is kind of eating that one a little bit too, because their running game is not as good. Juice Wells, being closer to 2022 juice wells than 2023 i get it it's a bitter pill to swallow uh but also he's not number two on Ole Miss in receiving that's Caden lee you know Caden lee's number two in reception or receiving yards and touchdowns juice has been more of just a big play threat it's that's more of a personal thing it's like that's a personal thing between south carolina and juice because for juice it's purely a redemption story he got another opportunity here but this weekend, it's going to be a lot of focus on, yeah, but why couldn't you do it here? So I get it. That's that traditional college sports thing, that traditional college sports angle. Um, and Juice is probably going to be talking his stuff too, you know. And <laughs> But for me, uh, from the Ole Miss side, and that's really all I can pay attention to, I don't really put much stock into it. I'm thinking more, can this offensive line protect Jackson Dart against another SEC defensive line? You know, I'm, I'm more concerned about, uh, whether or not they can remember that they have other playmakers like Juice Wells outside of Trey Harris and that the middle of the field exists, right? So there's there's a lot of the other things, I think, on the plate of Ole Miss fans, but for Juice in South Carolina, I completely get that storyline this week uh, because if Ole Miss was playing Ohio State, we'd be doing the same thing about Quinshawn Junkins. No, Dude, I was going to say, when, when you look at South Carolina, Ben, challenges the Gamecocks present, obviously they feel like they should be undefeated, had that really tough, hard-fought game. Against LSU, you mentioned they boat raced that Kentucky team that just beat Ole Miss. What are the challenges you see that South Carolina could give Ole Miss? And where are some, maybe some areas of opportunity for Ole Miss you think they could take advantage and maybe some advantageous matchups for the Rebels? Here's the problem. That's a great question. That's the question we always ask. I've been doing these podcasts, these game week podcasts with opposing uh, media guys for a long time. And what do we – and we typically ask that because – uh, after four, four or five weeks, you have a good idea of what they are. I don't think we have a clue what Ole Miss is now. <laughs> Everything we thought we knew about them has been flipped on its ear. We thought Jackson Dart was a Heisman candidate. We thought that Trey Harris was walking, I mean, moonwalking to a Bolitnikoff award. We thought that this defense, and this defense is every bit as good. I think defensively, that's where you know they'll be in every single game they play. That's It is a championship-caliber defense. It's that we're talking about the offensive struggles. And it is only one week, but it came on the backdrop of the first ugly loss for Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss, and two, after the whole world said you hadn't played nobody. So there are areas to exploit, but Oh, there are areas to exploit against Kentucky. South Carolina showed that. Robbie Ashford showed that. You know, and, and no disrespect to Robbie Ashford, but Jackson Dart was supposed to be better than Robbie Ashford. Mm. And Jackson <laughs> Dart, he was a bad day. Now, I get it. He was seeing ghosts because that offensive line couldn't protect him. But, again, 
there was no one that is absolved of at least some responsibility on the offensive side from Saturday. Because defensively, 20 points allowed to an SEC team that's going to be in the postseason should always be enough for a Lane Giffen coach team. It should always be enough. And it wasn't. Everything looked so hard, so hard. There were opportunities deep underthrown by Jackson Dart. Is that all this offense is, a big play or bust offense? If that's the case, well, then competent teams, good teams, teams that believe themselves to be uh, ascending content- contenders like a South Carolina, well, they're going to whoop your butt. They're, they're going to take it to you, you know, because they're going to play their game. They're going to try to dictate and play who they are. Ole Miss is, in an, is facing an identity crisis. What are they? Because they were supposed to be this unstoppable offensive force with uh, the most weapons in modern-day his- history, and all we saw against the first team they played was 17 points. Turnovers, bad decisions, doubled up on time of possession. And Ole Miss is never going to win time of possession. However, doubled up and, I mean, almost tripled by halftime. That's the only reason they were in the game. It's because you allowed them to grind it up and the adjustments weren't made. Defensively, sure, they came out and they did the thing. Uh, they gave up a, a touchdown and they gave it up in the final minute. You could argue about the Barry and Brown play. Was there a push off? Was there not? That's excuse making. Should have never come to that, right? But the defense did its job. Offensively, I don't even think they know who they are. Uh, and that is a worrisome thing because that's never been in question under Lane Kiff. And the only time it really was was when they were trying to figure out it was going to be Jackson Dart or Luke Altmeyer. Now they're trying to figure out how the hell did you only score 17 against an SEC defense? A good one, a good one, but you were supposed to be the elite of the elite offenses in college football, and you weren't. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's a different week. It's a different mindset. Everything we thought we knew, everything we expected out of this team. I mean, you're seeing projections now for the Las Vegas Bowl, the Music City Bowl. Almost did it to itself. You know, they have nobody to blame but themselves here. Because, again, congrats to the haters. You know what I mean? Like, you proved the haters right. Now can you go in reverse course because you were favored, including against South Carolina in every game you played, and also Georgia before Kentucky. There was belief there, but now you're a disappointing bubble team, you know? Originally, you're like, oh, that, that could be for real. They could be a contender, a real national title contender, a fun story to follow. We all want some new, right? And then you did that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's going to be a fascinating game. And I'm going to tell you this. It's going to be hard as hell for Ole Miss to go in there and win that game, playing the offense they've been playing. But if they don't, if this week was messy, oh, boy, next week will be life support for, almost for a lot of people. You know, it's like because it was not supposed to be. Yeah, losing is one thing, but it's how you lost. It's how you lost. It's the offense was not dynamic. The offense wasn't getting the ball to its playmakers. And then you start asking, well, then where is Ulysses Bentley, the number one or the highest graded returning running back at the SEC, signed, re-signed an NIL deal with the Grove Collective to replace Quinshawn Jenkins? Where is he then, right? All those questions. Caden Priest, he has four, three, four catches in his last three games. That's the number seven highest graded returning tight end in the country. And Lane says, well, uh, yeah, but we've got a lot of options. Who are you taking the ball away from? Well, obviously, Ulysses Bentley and Caden (laughs) Priestcorn. You see what I'm saying? So why, if the middle of the field is lost and those guys aren't getting the ball and then you lose to Kentucky, it's just hard then to accept, oh, well, Henry Parrish is the only running back, Mm -hmm. right? Well, if that's it, then you're screwed because you don't have enough playmakers. So this this weekend is a put up or shut up. It's proven. Either Kentucky was the outlier or you were the pretenders. Everybody said you were. So go do the thing. Ben, you mentioned Ole Miss has proved the haters right. If they're going to prove the haters wrong this weekend, bounce back and beat South Carolina, what do they have to do? Score more points. And I know it's easy and stupid, but it's true. I mean, if you could have just watched every down, and I've done it multiple times of that Kentucky game. I just I had to see it because it made no sense, this offensive incompetency. You saw absolute domination by Kentucky on the, on the, on the line of scrimmage. No separation anywhere. They bracketed coverage 
to uh, Trey Harris. There's nothing to get. I mean, there was no getting the ball to Trey Harris after that first drive. So then what did Ole Miss do? Oh, well, we can't get the ball to Trey Harris. Now what? There was no adjustments made. So feeding your playmakers, remembering that Caden Priestcorn, I mean, he had 10 catches in the Peach Bowl. He was the MVP, and he has 10 catches through five games. Caden Priestcorn exists, right? Remembering that um, Ulysses Bentley, it, again, it would be different had Henry Parrish and Matt Jones, a former walk-on, balled out in a loss to Kentucky. They didn't. So, and you brought in Ulysses Bentley. You say it's not an injury issue, and you brought him in to replace Mikey Davis on kick returns. It seems personal. If it's a benching, say that. If he's hurt, say that. If it's personal, say that, right? Because you just lost to Kentucky and couldn't run the ball outside of a couple of Henry Parrish breakouts late. That's not going to work. That's not going to cut it. That's going to bury this team. Everything that people were concerned about, concerned about or asked about your team or questioned about your team, you proved them correct. And the only way to shut them up and to prove them wrong is to now win out. And after what you saw Saturday, defensively, you would go, oh, yeah, they're going to be in every game they play. But that offense, what was that? It looked like a shell of a Lane Kiffin offense. And that is most alarming because this is the best collection of talent. And it's not just the stupid idiot Homer saying this, the ginger Shrek speaking to you about it. You know, that's not what this is. Um, whatever you value, whatever analytics you value, PFF grading, pick whatever it is. Ole Miss has one of the very best all 22s, and a lot of that, most of it, is on the offensive side, and they put up 17 points against Kentucky. One of their be very best plays was because Jackson Dart instinctually rolled to his right. The game was on the line and said, oh, Caden Priest scored my 6-7 monster of a tight end is down there somewhere. And it worked. He was thinking completely – he was completely free of any responsibility, any consequence. He just said, I got to get the ball down there. And it worked. I don't know why that they're, they're so bad off script. But and what where where the adjustments were and why it took just a backyard play to make them look like Ole Miss offensively again. But if that if Kentucky wasn't the outlier, this is going to be a, a, a an historic season for all the wrong reasons. And uh, nobody wants that. Well, maybe well Ole Miss haters do, which is fine. You know, I mean that's that's the part of that's still the fun of college football. Um, but, yeah, it will be history for all the wrong reasons. Ben Garrett of the Ole Miss Spirit, the On3 affiliate for the Rebels. Ben, appreciate you taking the time, my friend. Let folks know, by the way, where they can check out all your great work. The Ole Miss Spirit, omspirit.com, affiliate of On3. And I'm sorry, your, your eyes do not deceive you. I had to move because my internet here in <laughs> New Albany, Mississippi, my perfect, perfect hometown, uh, but we still New Albany, Mississippi. Apparently, when you're in the country, the internet don't work too well, so I had to move <laughs> for my guy. But, uh, yeah, man, I'm excited about this game on Saturday. I really am. And uh, mainly because one way or another, we're going to learn everything we need to know about this Ole Miss team. And it's good that it's South Carolina. Because my last memory of South Carolina was years and years ago when Eric Norwood destroyed and wrecked havoc. Mm -hmm. And that was the loudest – I'd ever, the loudest stadium I'd ever been in. Houston Nutt finally moved Dexter McCluster back to run, like where he belonged, to running back. And they almost came back and won a game they just weren't supposed to lose. And I thought, man, I can't wait till Ole Miss can move past the days where they come into these stadiums, great as they are and dominant as they are and crazy as it is, and beat these teams they're supposed to beat, right? And then Kentucky happened. <laughs> so uh, it just shows that no matter how much you think things change, they stay the same, my friend. So OMSpirit.com and Philip on three. Talk of champions in your app, uh, your uh, podcast store, wherever you get your podcast on YouTube. Uh, you can learn, look up Talk of Champions Ole Miss, Ben Garrett Ole Miss, and my stupid face will pop up. And it'll be better framed and not in my kitchen because my internet will work next time. Ben, appreciate you taking the time, my friend. Let's definitely do it again soon. Anytime, buddy. Appreciate you.